You are listening to episode 71 of the Game Deflators podcast. My name is John, and I'm joined by my good friend Ryan. Hey, everybody, here at the Game Deflators podcast, we like to talk about games we've recently picked up, games we're currently playing, and this week we remix the Inflation Deflation Challenge. Dude, that came off a lot better than I thought it was. Uh, I, I can't believe we came up with that last minute, but that was perfect. Never underestimate, John. Never underestimate. So, hey, everybody, this week we are uh, we're going to be talking about all kinds of things going on. Uh, you know, there's some viral trends going on right now that everybody's aware of. Uh, Lots of memes. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, Nintendo Remix Bundle in uh, or Nintendo Remix Pack. Yep. For the Wii U in this week's Inflation Deflation Challenge. But let's start off with John. What'd you pick up, John? The question is, what did I not pick up, Ryan? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. I'm staring down the barrel of uh, 55 games John picked up this week. Uh, most of them garbage, might I add. But uh, no, actually, so I got some good stuff. I did a little bit of garage sailing the other day. Of course, sailing in my car. And I didn't see anything initially. Outside of us, by the way, I picked up a copy of Band of Brothers DVD set. Uh, perfect condition which was nice and an old Stephen King book that I apparently have three copies of now so probably shouldn't have got that for 50 cents on the bright side though uh, hit up a flea market I didn't see anything initially but I came back on the way home saw a little pink sign for garage sale hit my brakes and was like all right this will be my last garage sale today lo and behold 320 gigabyte Xbox 360 elite for 20 dollars like come on dude can can you beat that no, you cannot. I and guess you could. Free or $10. Yeah, yeah, I guess Or so. lower price. Um, and on top of that, uh, it was in the original packaging, a white garbage bag. So that was perfectly laid out for me. Uh, plus, they had uh, another garbage bag filled with a ton of terrible games, but there are a few gems in there. So from a price standpoint, uh, we've got SpongeBob, Bikini Bottom, uh, Namco Museum. I don't think it's too high priced, but I've already got a copy. Uh, there was like an Omanusha, Last of Us, Uncharted, Red Dead Redemption, several low-end Wii games. So nothing too crazy out of that. Um, so that, that was pretty good. I got that. And then there was a bag of wires. So bag of wires, which included some controllers, some cables, and a PS3 controller that I got for 10 So altogether, 50 bucks for the 360 Elite, all those games, and the uh, wires and controller. I think it was a pretty good deal. Uh Coming back to the flea market, though, went back, said, all right, well, I want to pick up something else while I was there, um, and I need my wife to come back with some landscaping items, and we ended up going to a random booth. The lady had just set up. It was her first time there, and she just had tons and tons and tons of games just laid out, so I had first pickings, and I picked up quite a few titles like uh, Crash Twin Sanity, uh, Sega Superstars Tennis, Phantom Brave on the PS2, Rampage Total Destruction, and uh, Dragon Quest Eight with the disc uh, inside a Hollywood video case, nonetheless. So that's pretty interesting. I don't know if that's going to have any impact on value, per se. Kind of, you know, like the old blockbuster packaging and such for N64 games. Yeah, I'm sure there's somebody out there that has, like, a full set of a just, like, the GameStop cases yeah. that they have. Yeah, so this one's, like, Hollywood video. So, I mean... That's it, a collection nobody's building towards. Right? Hollywood video collections. Yeah. In fact, I picked up two this week. Uh, Reign of Fire was the other Hollywood video uh, set. So, really interesting pickups this week. And I don't even remember seeing that many Hollywood videos around here. I don't know if it was... Yeah, I don't know about here, man. In Florida, we had tons of them when I was out in that area. So, yeah. I, either way, dude. The 360 Elite, like, lo and behold, was like the top of the line out of all of this. I want to say they're going for like 100 to 150 plus online. 20 bucks, can't beat it. I'm hooking it up. I'm keeping a 360, and Blue Dragon is waiting for me to play it now, along with Lost Odyssey when I pick that game up. Lost Odyssey's yeah. awesome. So that was my pickups. I am going to assume that you picked up nothing. One of, no, 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 no. You picked up one of my games. You're uh, what you're currently playing. You picked it up off my shelf. Oh, yeah, but that was a long time ago. It was last week. What? Yeah, right, oh, right okay, after. Okay, yeah, yeah, right you're right, after, right. Yeah. So, so after I took recording, a, it technically yeah. counts as pickups for the week. Yeah, I did. So I picked up uh, Sekido, John's copy, which uh, if you remember, there was a lot of controversy with John's copy when he got it initially, being lost in the mail and having to get a new one. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty interesting. That whole process. But, uh, so, jumping into uh, playing, then I've been playing Sekido, and I'm finding it very, very hard compared to Bloodborne, just because I'm not really sure what to do. I actually called John the other day to to ask him some advice on what to do in the game, because it's like I keep feeling like I need to be more somehow in control of what I'm doing. I feel like I just kind of run up and just swing until somebody dies. Like, you know, it's I'm not really paying attention to the normal enemies like stagger bar or posture bar because it it hardly matters. It's just like usually three hits or two hits and then they're out. But um all the mini bosses I fought so far, so I beat the first uh ogre and it was just running up slamming as many attacks as i could and then spamming the flame cannon arm and just trying to stun lock him and it just it doesn't feel as elegant as maybe some of the fights in bloodborne like i felt like you know i was really reading the enemy and getting out of the way and this feels like i'm just kind of running in and mashing and hoping for the best i also fought last night uh juzo the drunkard at the harada estate and did you get the uh the assistance though yeah okay cool yeah, yeah i did the assistance and i did one of the you know stealth kill of his life bars i tried doing like getting him to run towards me and then doing one of the stealth kills and then running away and coming back but it like heals yeah yeah it heals so you the can't bar. like double do that no. unfortunately um and even that one so i like, took out all the the small guys that were around him got the stealth on him had the other guy just start fighting him and then it's like i just kind of like run in and do a couple hits run in and do a couple hits i just i don't know if i'm just not getting the rhythm or if i am doing it the right way and it just kind of feels bad compared to i don't know there was just something so remember i, I told you this game it's Bloodborne to me was more like it felt like hack and slash and try to, you know, knock off as much as you can. If you had assistance, great. Mm -hmm. You could easily knock down a boss. Dark Souls, kind of similar, but there's patterns, right? Yeah. Sekiro, there's so much more strategy involved in this game. It's not a I can run in and hack a whole bunch and then like do a I couple think it's dodges. It's the blocking that's the problem because it's like in Bloodborne, like there's no. Yeah, blocking you well there is but you don't necessarily need to use a yeah. post or whatever it is in that game uh dark souls you kind of use it a little bit but mm. you're more on the okay let me just kind of figure out a pattern Sekido's like you not only need to figure out a pattern which does change from time to time depending on the boss uh you know you might run in there thinking all right here's the pattern and they just lay out something random yeah. on you um and it really depends on how you're playing it uh, but there's also the, you know, you gotta, you gotta parry a little bit more in this game and you have to have some strategy involved. So, okay, I'm going to use uh, the ax, for example, and stun my enemy and go ahead and lay a bunch of hits knowing though that I had to, I have to step back and run away. Yeah. You know, little things like that. And it's not necessarily cheesing, but there are a lot of ways to cheese in this game. Well, it said in like the tips I was reading online, like, don't forget what you are. You're a ninja. Play like a ninja, like be underhanded, be stealthy exactly so, so there's a lot tied to that and you know I, I told you about um the one character which i'm guessing you got past via i forget his name but he's the guy at the spear no i i i went i was trying to fight him and i did what you said i killed everybody and i jumped on the roof mm -hmm. and then he just never like lost his attention to me like he just circled around down on the bottom so then I kind of jumped off the roof into the river, yeah. swam all the way up the river, and that's where I kind of found my way over towards where uh, Juzo was yeah. and kind of went a different way. I do like how there's, like, branching paths, and it doesn't feel like I'm only up against one wall. It feels like I have a few different walls, and I can kind of go whichever way I can eventually weasel my way in through. Yeah, and you'll get to a point, dude, where you just kind of learn the, the lay of the land in that game. So you might have a situation where it's like, three different enemies mm -hmm. and you're just going to get to a point where you could just blaze through and you're like all right i'm going to stab this guy in the back i'm going to run around this area really quick jump over this guy hit this guy with a couple hits and like you'll get in this like sort of pattern and rhythm in this game to where certain sections just really aren't that hard that's and it's easier to pass what I, through yeah that's kind of what i figured yesterday when i was approaching juzo like i was trying to be very cautious and like 
you know, okay, I run around the corner, kill this guy, jump on the roof, wait for these guys to walk under, drop down, stealth kill one of them, run away. And eventually I just kind of, after doing that like four or five times, because I didn't want to die fighting the boss. So it's like once I would die once, I'd just kind of run back rest and then have to work my way back through everyone again. Yeah. Eventually I was just like, I'm treating these like regular enemies with way too much. Like, yeah, they can hurt me just like in any of the, you know, Seki Soulborn games. Seki Soulborn. <laughs> nice. So uh, I was just like, I could just take these guys out. And once I kind of started treating the regular mobs, like I kind of started treating them in Bloodborne as just kind of like, all right, this is just three button presses and then they're done and then move on to the next one. It it got way shorter. Like I wasn't wasting five or six minutes on the approach every time. And I got some good experience and unlocked a new uh, skill tree thing. Well, just remember, we got our uh, Game Deflators YouTube page where you can see a lot of his videos. And yeah, check out exactly. How I I've got it. a lot of uh, John's former postings that I could take as advice for yeah. me moving forward. But also this week, I jumped into Persona 4. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, and it's great. I'm five hours in. I'm loving it. But I feel like five hours in, I just finished the tutorial. Like, I've just kind of now have the story set up and the characters, you know, uh, I've got a full party now. And it feels like it's going to start opening up moving forward. And I'm really into a lot of the quality of life i can see why people really dig the persona series because like i've never played a game where it's okay i go to the shop uh what do you want to buy oh i want to buy this new weapon okay do you want to equip that weapon yeah do you want to sell the old weapon yeah and it's just all done like right there no you know clicking in and out and going through like that's super easy the uh the combat system has like if you attack something with its weakness, you get another move. So <clears throat> if you're going up against enemies that you can just kind of flatline through, you can just kind of abuse that system to make it much quicker. Everything's real snappy. The loading times aren't terrible. Uh, the voice acting's all really good. The visuals are awesome. It looks great on the Vita. I always love playing my Vita, so I'm really excited to start digging into the meat of that. Yeah, that sounds good, dude. I um I haven't played much of the Persona series, but I have heard great things. And there's a lot of folks that, you know, Nintendo fans really like clamor for like we want Persona so bad. Like they they See, all want. See, I would it on love to get Persona Five, but not till it comes out on Switch. Gotcha. Which, as of right now, there are no plans. Even though Joker is a Smash character, but then again, I mean, you know, they did bring Final Fantasy VII, the game that notoriously never was on Nintendo to Switch. So yeah. Oh, uh, dude, one other thing that I picked up, I forgot to mention, well, it's technically not a pickup, it's a pre-order. Uh, I went ahead and pre-ordered the TurboGrafx-16 Mini on Amazon the other day. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, well, it's a thing, and um, it was sold out, actually, on pre-orders about a week and a half ago, and I was so pissed. I'm like, damn it, I missed out on my opportunity to get the TurboGrafx-16 Mini, and there's a lot of good games in there. It's like 50 games, and there's some pretty decent stuff. I even think there's Ease 1 and 2, if I'm correct, mm. are on there. But, I've never played the E's. Yeah, I've heard great things about it, so I'm really excited to get that console. Uh, but it was like 100 bucks pre-order, and it was supposed to come out March 16th, but due to all of the craziness going on in the world, uh, they've gone ahead and delayed that, and it says now December 31st, 2020. That's a major delay, so we'll get into that a little well, later. Well, especially if it was supposed to come out... In March. Like, well, I mean, it was supposed to be out tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Breaking the veil there, folks. Exactly. So uh, as far as what I'm playing right now, uh, Neverwinter Nights, I, my wife and I started playing it again uh, last night. We were finished, or not last night, two nights ago. We were finishing up some dungeons, and I fell asleep midway through. So I don't even know what happened. She was just blazing through certain dungeons, and I just... Are you fairly far in that game? It's a pretty big game. I don't know. We're on chapter two. Uh, so no no not really <laughs> not remotely i think there's like eight chapters in the game and we're just we're doing so many side quests in that game that it's just taking us forever we're like constantly doing side yeah. quests clearing out every dungeon 100 percent, getting all the loot that we can i mean you guys are never gonna play another game no we never <laughs> will we'll, we'll play that game for like another two years i bet so we're doing that and then shenmue uh i got third place in my first uh, race. Ah. So uh, my first forklift race, third place, and then I started working in the harbor as a uh, forklift operator. 
And so I went ahead and met my quota on the first day, or beat my quota actually, and got my 50 yen raise per crate, and uh, met the Mad Angels, or several of them, beat the hell out of them twice, and that's where I'm at. Are you, like, any more into the game? Like, I I know that so those kind enough, of life moments like yeah. that are kind of what the game's about. So doing that and then going and grabbing a soda and a gachapon on your way home to train. So I'm not a big fan of the whole, like, having the train thing and getting a soda and the gachapon. Like, I'm not a fan of those life moments, but the story is captivating me a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So the whole concept of having to get my plane ticket and having that uh, Chinese agency screw me out of my money and having to deal with them and the mad angels meeting up with me to beat me up and, you know, turning the opposite where I beat them up. Uh, The whole thing of being in the Harbor and having mad angels come out and say, Hey, you've got to pay your debt as a rookie employee and then beating them up. And that whole story is kind of working out. What's kind of still frustrating is when you go up to different characters and you repeat the same things in the audio and the dialogue and that type of stuff. It just seems so mechanical and grainy. You know, it's just really frustrating from that piece, right? Yeah. I wish it was a more polished game, and it really isn't in that respect. But I am enjoying the story a little bit more. Uh, it really is kind of pulling me in from that respect. But it's not, still not my favorite title out there. I don't think I'll do two or three I yeah think, we kind of we kind of determined that already <laughs> yeah so i mean if i do it'll be like down the road i'll say all right it's time to you know play shenmue 2 and then if i see like three for 10 bucks down the road it's like all right cool i'll pick up three for ten dollars that type of stuff but it's not something that i'm eagerly like wanting to get done with one so i can race towards number two and jump into number three and have a blast with it it's just not it's not my cup of tea and uh, for some people out there, it is. There's a lot of great reviews. A lot of people enjoy that game. It's very much a, a niche game. And that's kind of where I stand with it, dude. So I'm still up in the air on what I want to play next, whether it's God of War, Ark the Lad 3, or, you know, jumping into to something super simple. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at. I think I'm going to give up on uh, Link's Awakening. Really? Yeah, I'm just... You're not enjoying it? I don't know. It's okay. Like, it's really cute, but I'm just not ever feeling motivated to play it, especially now that I have Persona. Like, if I want something handheld, I'm going to be jumping into that because I've got 65 more hours to get through on that or whatever now. Yeah. Uh, So I'm going to check out Gamefly this week and see what's coming out soon and see if I can't maybe get my hands on something a little bit different to kind of to mix up what I'm playing right now. Yeah, sounds like a plan, man. Would Get a you, third game in the mix. Or you considering maybe a shooter? You considering getting rid of Gamefly at any point? Um, you know, as of now, I'm not just because, like, I mean, I know that I can borrow just about any game from you, but as far as trying to get my hands on and play new titles, like, it may be tricky through Gamefly just because, you know, how it is. Yeah. But I'd. St- still think that i'm in a better position to have gamefly and try to get my hands on newer games to try to stay on top of it than to buy them makes sense yeah yeah for sure all right well let's uh we had just talked about the uh, turbo graphic 16 mini getting delayed to december and that's not the only thing delayed the it's world also, of delays and there's tons of things being canceled so everybody knows what's going on in the news right now we're not gonna elaborate too much on that but uh so first things first e3 got canceled E3 was canceled. This comes directly from the ESA's website. Uh, They are, you know, canceling all these events that have large amounts of people together because they don't want, you know, the spread of the virus to really get too out of hand. So, unfortunately, we're not going to have an E3 this year. I mean, they may, they are going to try to turn their efforts into doing some digital presentations. I mean, Devolver Digital does a great job with those every year. Nintendo's been doing their directs for a while every year. Uh, Sony didn't participate in E3 last year. Or the year before, I believe. Wasn't going to participate again this year. And uh, But, man, they've canceled like events left and right. We'll kind of talk about that some more a little bit later. But uh, ESL 1 LA was also canceled. That was the Dota major that was supposed to take place next week. Uh, people have backed out of PAX. I don't know if that one's still happening or not. I think PAX was closed. I know Sony pulled out of PAX. So there's just 
lots of things hitting. Oh, your packs already passed, didn't it? Yeah, packs passed. Well, there's a couple yeah. packs. Well, I know the most recent one went on. Okay. Yeah, that one did go, and okay. Sony did back out of that though. I think Limited Run Games did as well, hmm. if I'm correct. So uh, I yeah. know GDC was canceled. So, so th there's lots of there's lots of people out there that are you know afraid to try to go out and get together and be in big crowds and you know we wouldn't encourage anybody to you know go out and try to start their own convention right now it'd be a bad time for that but as far as attending any other events you know just be cautious watch what you're uh you know going out to and it seems like they're kind of taking everything away anyway so we'll see what kind of news that we're gonna get i just you know, we're still a few months out from when E3 was supposed to be. And I get so excited for E3 every year. And it just, it's understandable, but it feels like a big blow and a letdown. And with the way E3's kind of been going, I mean, they have a quote in the article. Uh, we look forward to bringing you E3 in 2021 as a reimagined event that brings fans, media, and the industry together in a showcase that celebrates the global video game industry. So... E3's definitely needed some new kind of something, especially since, you know, Nintendo's not there and Sony's not there putting on, like, live press conferences anymore. But I'm afraid this might just kind of be, you know, one of the final nails and maybe E3 is just kind of going to go away altogether. Well, I don't think it'll go away altogether because it's, it's not just video games, right? There's a lot more... Elect it's the Electronics Expo, right? So you're going to get more than just like a Sony and Nintendo and Microsoft there. You're going to get a lot of other organizations that are involved in the industry in some capacity that are going to be attending. So maybe it turns into more of a, an indie show. Maybe we have like premier indie titles and other game companies coming through and really taking that platform uh, that's now, you know, not going to include Sony and not going to include Nintendo. So it'll be interesting to see how they come through next year. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, Nintendo, Sony, maybe Mike, I think Microsoft actually said they're all doing digital at this point for their press conferences. And why not? You're going to reach a wider audience in that respect. You're not limited to the constraints of E3 and their scheduling and everything else. You can kind of dictate what you want to do, how long you want to do it. There's, there's no constraints. So why worry about going to E3 at this point? Uh, so we'll see how this all plays out. I am kind of shocked, though, that they canceled it now versus waiting like another month to see how things progress i mean maybe it's just that you're trying to save money because if you keep moving the longer you keep moving forward before postponing the more money is going to get put into things because that's another month of people you know securing like not just the booth space but the physical booth creating you know nintendo likes to make like large elaborate displays for their showroom floor area so like all the artistry and craftsmanship that goes into putting together the actual physical production you know those things either need to stop or not start in order to not lose even more money yeah i mean it is kind of good on e3 to do that it's just it's odd because i've seen other conferences like phoenix fan fusion sent out an email yesterday saying, hey, we're closely monitoring things and uh, it would be premature of us to cancel our show right now because the show's in May. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm like, this is in June. Like, there's a lot of stuff that can well, happen Phoenix between Fan now Fusion and... Phoenix Fan Fusion is also not an international world-renowned event. It's still a big event, though. Sorry, Phoenix Fan Fusion. We love you. Yeah, it's still... Give us some media passes. We'll show up. We're not afraid. <laughs> no comments on that. Uh, I'll come in and, like full-blown <laughs> attire it's so, cosplay it is cosplay yeah it'll be half-life cosplay yeah. so the survival suit it's, it's crazy so you know uh, what you could do you could pull off a pretty good gordon freeman cosplay probably i probably could yeah probably could that'd be pretty awesome you should do that i should do that we'll, we'll just come in as that you hear that phoenix fan fusion if you're listening media passes we'll both cosplay half-life there It'll we be go fantastic. i'll be a head crab <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a crazy time right now. I just think it's a little premature of E3 to be canceling right now. But, you know, it is what it is. And I don't know their financial situation. I don't know how many vendors have been secured. And there might have been call out from their exhibitors to say, hey, you got to let us know now because we're pumping in yeah. thousands of dollars to make this happen. And, and these conferences aren't like 
super cheap either. No. Like some of these companies are putting in like a million to two million dollars to make these things happen. Well, and, and E3 is yeah. not even the biggest. I mean, like Comic Con, Comic Con attracts like what is it like two hundred thousand plus people in that one weekend to go through that convention center. Like, yeah, but that's I think, a ton of money. But that's different in the respect that E3, I believe, pulls in investors. So you have that. You have the journalists that are tied to it. This is more like Comic Con, while it's huge and you have like, it's more of a fan gathering, right? Versus E3 to me feels more like not only a fan E3's gathering. E3 has always been more of like a media or an yeah, industry event. Exactly. Versus Comic Con, while there is some industry tied into it, it's primarily a fan based event. So, yeah, we're going to have a teaser video for the next Marvel movie coming out, that type of thing. Versus merch. E3. Yeah. Way versus, more merch. Versus E3 is like, hey, we're demoing these games that are going to be on our console. So invest in us now because this is kind of the future Stand of Sony. Stand in line all day to play one game e for 20 minutes. Exactly. So that's kind of the difference there. And uh, I can see why this will, this will be canceled now versus later on because there are a lot of dollars being tied in. Uh, well, so let's see. Uh, the next thing I, I kind of want to skip over to this one really quick um so time to admit that the launch of ps5 and xbox series x may be delayed this is by pramif at gaming bolt so obviously we've got cancellations of events we've now got the potential, potential delays. delays so this isn't saying yeah it's definitely canceled or definitely delayed but it is saying hey look supply chains are being constrained right now by everything that's going on well your system you just yeah. pre-ordered that's a perfect state like when yeah. You know, the place of manufacturing in China is having these problems like that gets into, well, is it safe to produce and send these products elsewhere at this point in time? So it's like, I don't know why they decided to have an eight month delay on what was the console? The Turbo Graphics. The Turbo Graphics. OK, so, you know, that's a giant delay on something that was like finalized and ready to like ready to happen and i mean we still don't know any confirmed facts about the ps5 like it's driving me crazy every week that goes by and we show up and it's like i just i want to know what it looks like i want to know how much it's going to cost and that's something that we probably will get in their like digital conference they do or virtual conference i mean if they even participate in that well no they'll do that they'll do but a virtual they've been conference pulling out of uh, events left and right due to you know kind of the climate right now and that's understandable but the fact that they still haven't even showed a picture like they could have showed a picture three months ago when we found out what the series x looked like yes, and i Sony know we is... talked just last week i think that you know they're not afraid to be silent because they're already the so far ahead of the competition anyways in what's happening now i just i'm afraid that if it keeps going on that they're not showing us anything it's going to make people assume that, you know, what this article is talking about could be true. Like, you know, delays in the systems not actually launching this year. I'm going to be way more inclined to believe that if it's still just a fictional item that nobody's ever seen and nobody knows how much it's going to be. Like the less concrete evidence is out there, the more I'm inclined to believe that it's going to be delayed. Yeah, I would I would probably line up with you on that as well so the one question i do have though is how is this going to affect a lot of those premier like triple a titles that are coming out right you mean all those ones that are fully backwards compatible with ps4 and they're not exclusively launching on the new consoles yeah those and uh you know you've got final fantasy 7 like can we see a delay coming in with that i mean it was already pushed back for development reasons i believe to be april 19th right mm. are we going to see a delay because of supply chains is it going to be a situation where they're not manufacturing the games right now and are we going to see this thing push back several months maybe even later on into holiday season uh, because they're not able to ship things maybe you've got borders being closed like who knows what's going on with that like these are obviously like less important things currently in the world and this is kind of like video game world problems but at the same time, it does make you wonder as a gamer, like, am I going to have that title in my hand in another month? Or am I going to have to wait another three, four months for it to come out? And so I do question these things. Yeah, he mentions in the article uh, a problem that the Saturn had at launch with being too shorthanded with how many consoles they actually had to distribute to retailers. And that being a major blow 
to them and a contributor to PlayStation's success because those retailers felt jilted by not being supplied and kind of did not provide the Saturn with a place to be sold at afterwards because they weren't given any product to sell when the initial launch happened. So, it, And that obviously screwed them up for the Dreamcast when it came out because – you know, there was other contributing factors to the Dreamcast, you know, failing over time, even though it's still a great console, is, you know, you've had all these retailers who already had this negative, you know, thought on Sega due to all the Saturn problems back then. And then the Dreamcast comes out, not only is it, you know, not including a DVD player like a PS2, but it didn't get that notoriety in the market during that Saturn period of time that other consoles received. So you end up with a situation where it's like the general consumer is not going to want to purchase a Dreamcast because, hey, PlayStation just came out. I had a PlayStation 1. I had an N64. These are all things that, you know, contributed as well to Dreamcast failing. And so I don't think we're going to run into that situation, though, if the PS5, it, mainly because there's a general understanding of here's what's occurring and here's why it's going to happen. It's not a Sony isn't willing to produce yeah. or Sony can't produce. It's there's other outlying factors that are contributing to this. The Wii is a great example of shortages, not necessarily shortages, but there was a high demand for that product. They couldn't keep up with the, you know, the influx of demand. And so you ran into a situation where you couldn't get your hands on a Wii for, what, three, four months? Yeah. During that period of time. And it was a super cheap console. Unless you're me and you went to Midnight Launch. Yeah, no. I, and I, they cut the line off two people behind me. I got my Wii after the Wii U's lifespan. so that, <laughs> Or just before the Wii U started. So that kind of gives you an idea on where I started with the Wii. But I don't think we'll run into that exact problem where Sony is like shunned from the market because no, of a delay or because of lack of I can't imagine either, but with speculation of this also potentially being the last console generation, yeah. it it really kind of sucks to have, you know, something like this kind of smudge that that launch, especially because everybody's been so excited for it. So we'll see what happens over, you know, the course of the next few months. But, you know, if things don't change soon and they don't actually get their manufacturing in place it could be another one of those oh look at all these ps5 games i got for christmas and now i'm waiting for march to roll around to get my ps5 that <laughs> happened to me with the 360 yeah i mean that could happen so wait you bought all your games in advance and then i the got everything for christmas except the console Huh. Because the console was like, there was just not enough of them. I did that myself with the PlayStation 3. I would buy games before the console came out. John, uh, you, I'm sure you have games for consoles you don't even own. Uh, You know what? I don't think so. Really? Yeah, just, I mean, if you want to count the Game Gear as being broken as owning Game Gear, Counting game Gear games. Okay, fine. You can count that. Uh, No. Oh, Vita. I don't own a Vita and I have uh. Vita games. So that, that's about it. Everything else I own. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty solid on that. Uh, even the Ataris. I have like 5,200 games and 7,800 games. I own both or all three of those consoles. All those 7,200 needs to be repaired. I've got uh, I've got the pieces here somewhere to repair it. Uh, okay. So next thing to jump into here, uh, and this falls right in line with what we're saying right now, uh, are, is having too many games a problem? Not if you're quarantined inside of your house, it's not. Exactly. And now if the electricity goes out, <laughs> I have batteries. But that's about it. So this is an article written by Dylan Littriel of Culture Gaming. And uh, really what he's kind of getting to in this article is uh, selection overload. So having far too many games. And I have experienced this numerous times with my collection. I can imagine. It's intimidating. I mean, we play one game a week for the show. And it's like staring at the wall, we're always like, what do we pick? I, it doesn't help that John's trying to amass an RPG collection and you don't really get enough out of a initial impression of an RPG to really be fair to it, so... Well, I mean, it's not... RPGs maybe consist of, what, 15% of my collection? So there's a lot of games on this shelf that we could play. I mean, the Wii? There are tons of games, and I'm already spotting one that we should play. So there's a lot out here that I've got and uh now that I have a 360 we can play some of those 360 games up there. So I think we're we're in pretty good shape here, dude. But uh to get back to this article. Uh yeah, so basically it's selection overload. So the idea is you just got done with work, you just got done with a major test at school, you've had a stressful day, you want to come home and you want to play a game 
And then you stare at this giant wall. And I'm not even as bad as some people. I have like double, triple what I have. So you've got this giant wall of games. You're like, what do I play? And then you run into a situation. I'll just kind of play it through somebody that, or for those that don't have this experience. I walk into this room and I look at the shelf and go, what do I want to play? I pick up maybe three, four games, look at them and say, okay, I kind of want to play this one. You hold it in your hand for a little bit. You read the back. And then you're like, well, how long is it going to take me to beat this game? Because I want to try and get something quick. How long to beat.com. Exactly. And that's actually reference. Great source for anybody that's looking to, that has a big collection and wants to kind of manage their time on games. So a good example might be uh, Ukulele. When I first picked up that game, I looked at it and said, eh, I don't want to spend that much time playing this platformer. I put it back. Now I had it in my hands. I was ready to play and I put it back. Eventually we did beat it. Uh, you know, I've picked up games like, uh, you know, different small RPGs. I'm like, well, let me see how long this is going to take to beat. No, I don't want to put that much time into it. Let me try a different type of game. So you really just find yourself going back and forth with all these titles until you come down to a game you want to play, which is part of the reason why when we record these episodes and you're like, well, what are you going to play next? I have no idea. I could say right now I'm going to play God of War after Shenmue and I might pick up a totally different game outside of God of War. And I mean, this is really decisions that come down last minute or like hours before I actually plan to play a game. I might have this full intention of going home and I'll see something else on my shelf and say, you know what? I want to try that now. So it, it really is. I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it, it it's, can potentially be a problem. And I mean, even for people out there like me that aren't massive game collectors, there's always that, well, Am I really utilizing my time with these games well? Like, I was frustrated playing Sekiro last night, but Sekiro is a game that's meant to be frustrating to play, so that's understandable. But, you know, I didn't finish Final Fantasy XII yet because it's just a few bosses, and, you know, as interested as I am in finishing Final Fantasy XII, I really just want to be done with it to be done with it, not necessarily, like, if I cared enough about the story and the characters to finish the game, I would have done so already. So it's like, it says a lot that I'm always kind of trying to go on to the next new shiny thing. Cause sometimes you just get your, your run through of that. And it's like, is it worth it to finish this game? Even though I don't have a lot left, am I going to enjoy my time? Do I want to play something else? And it's like, sometimes you got to be willing to let go and be like me and just let the games go. I can't do that, man. I I seriously cannot. I mean, I, I've done that numerous times in the years, but I typically will go back to a game. So Final Fantasy VII is a prime example. I had a bad experience with it because I got a, there was a glitch in the game that would not allow me to go back up and train and get the material I needed. So I had to restart that game, and it, which really sucked. But it was it was cool in the aspect of I went back to that game. I had played numerous hours, probably. 35, 40 hours were put in that game at that time. I came back and put in those hours again because I wanted to beat that game. There are games that I have on the shelf right now that I have started and I have saved data for and haven't beat, but I will go back to them at some point in time and beat them when I see that data. I wish that I was smart enough to, like, every time I played a game, have two save files and just, like, every hour just switch which save file i'm saving on to that way you know if something happens you can always just go back to the other file so but I, nobody's that smart no i, I do that for, <laughs> i do that for my rpgs actually so when i did not so, for final fantasy 7 apparently uh, not for final fantasy 7 no <laughs> so i started doing actually after that and star ocean 2 so star ocean 2 uh the copy that i had it was interesting it it had some scratches on it so there was a or no it wasn't scratches it corrupted on me. My save file corrupted on me. And I had to start the entire game over at that point. I was probably level 50-something at the time. And for anybody who hasn't played Star Ocean 2, definitely play it. That game is pure out amazing. One of the greatest RPGs I've ever played. But with that particular title, file corrupted, level 40, 50, around that range, and I had to restart it. And I was so down that I didn't pick up that game for another two, three years because I was just so frustrated that that happened. When I started playing it again... Not only was I saving pretty much every opportunity I have, but every like few levels I gained, I would save and I had multiple save files in place. Mm. So if it corrupted, I had the opportunity to go back to my other yeah. save file, which wasn't too far off. And I started doing that for just about everything. So if it wasn't, you know, 
if it was a game that auto saved, I would typically create another save file. So Fallout yeah. is a good example of that. Always had two save files going on at one point in time, just to make sure that I didn't get screwed over. So uh, yeah, I mean that kind of goes out of what we were discussing here initially. But you know, there's a lot of people that um, with those big collections, even with smaller ones, that run into the same problem: the selection issues and having to decide what you want to play. And I'm sure we'll have that issue here shortly when we uh, finish our inflation deflation challenge. Yeah. So anybody, if you find yourselves, uh, you know, trapped in your home for whatever reason in the coming days, don't let the, uh, the choice paralysis get to you. Just, just pick something and have fun with it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, before we get into our inflation deflation, uh, if you enjoyed what you listened to and you're still with us, catch us on, uh, Instagram, you can catch us on Facebook as at V Game Deflators. Twitter, Twitter at just Game, Game Deflators. Deflators. Yep. And uh, Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Podcast Addict, anywhere that you can hear a podcast, we are on it. If you don't see us on there, let, let us, us know, know and we'll try to be on there. And five star reviews. Only five star reviews. Only. Actually, you know what? If you can, leave us six star reviews. That's a five star review with a comment that says bonus star. That works. Yeah, I like that. All right. Inflation, deflation challenge for this week. Yeah, so this week we took a look at the NES Remix Pack for the Wii U, and uh, we were trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what this game's all about. I wasn't exactly sure going into it myself. I thought it was just kind of like, oh, it's a bunch of NES titles on a wii u disc that seems way better than the virtual console and having to buy them all separately i was wrong it is not a bunch of full games it is even cooler kind of it's a bunch of challenges so you've got uh classic titles like uh mario mario 3 mario 2 dr mario balloon fight balloon fight yeah sight bike so there's a mix on this one this is nes remix pack which has the nes remix one and two each one has its own collection of games and it's a bunch of challenges so you start off with all right uh you're mario on world one one of mario or super, super mario, mario bros original, yeah. and you've got a star run through kill 10 enemies as quickly as you can cool you did that here's some stars go on to the next game and you and you accumulate points as well yeah you get uh points and high scores and you uh get there's a three star rating on each of the challenges to try to get somehow you can get rainbow stars which i managed to do once and i don't know what those do but i'm sure they're wonderful and just something for completionists to have all shiny stuff i'm sure it drives gerard crazy it probably does so yeah the game obviously is a really cool concept it's taking a lot of different games and it's not necessarily re-envisioning them it's just basically saying hey here's some older titles and complete certain tasks you never would have thought to complete like getting 50 coins within a period of time within the challenge mode so there is a challenge mode or championship mode championship i think that's trying to kind of recreate like the nintendo championships yeah like they had back in the 90s yeah which was really cool like you start with mario 3 and it's like, hey, you've got to get 50 coins. And uh, it ha- and you have like a five, no, six minute timer, I think. Yeah, it's like six minutes, get 50 coins in. And then 25 coins using uh, Mario 3 still. And then it jumps into, I want to say it's Super Mario Bros. And then like Dr. Mario. So yeah, yeah so it kind of transitions you through the different games. And it was really cool. I actually really enjoyed that part. And it gives you a high score at the end of the day. It's like Which I won. Which you did win. Um, that kind of shocked me. John tried twice, and he still couldn't best me. Well, I bested you the first time because you hadn't played yet. So uh, <laughs> you beat my score. So I've beaten John in basketball because he's never played me. Yeah, you don't want to play me in basketball. No, I don't. No, you don't. So overall, I thought the game was a lot of fun. It's great concept. It kind of throws in that, like, quick angry birds type of feel to it you know yeah. where you're trying to get like the three stars and oh no 
I didn't get three stars. I got to go back and do better at this challenge and try and increase the amount of stars and points that I get. And we traded off each challenge. It was a great way to kill time with a friend. Like you could really sit down and have an all out good afternoon oh, yeah, doing this sure. and trying to beat each other's scores or trying to, I can't get past this challenge. You try the challenge. John had like a tough time with one of them. And I thought that I was going to have to take over, but he, he pulled it off at the last minute. Well, it was more, so there was one particular one. It's kind of like, it felt to me like lost levels, but it was Mario one. And all it was, was you're just running. Like you're in dash mode the whole time and you literally can just jump and that's it. It's like an endless runner and, kind of thing. And of course you had the fish flying everywhere. So we had that one and we just kept like, or me really just kept hitting a fish at this one jump, I'm like, what the hell do I do? I'm like, well, maybe if I jump on the box and over, then I'll be fine. That, or the brick, that didn't work. So it's like, well, what if I hit myself into it, takes a pause, and then I jump? That, of course, worked. So progressed through it, and probably about six or seven tries in, I was like, all right, cool, we're good. Now, if I would have been playing that game, you know, just on my own without being forced to dash, would have beat it right oh, yeah, away. Yeah. 100% would have been fine. But it was the fact that I was forced into a dash mode it's that, that was extra challenge. Exactly. That little bit of extra. And as you, with any retro game, you continue to play them, you get better with them. And you fully understand obstacles in your way and how to get past those obstacles. So that was one of those situations. There was an obstacle in my way. I figured out what I had to do. And I progressed through a level with no issue. Everything seemed pretty easy but we were only doing like you know the first couple challenges of each of the games to try to get a handle on it some of the controls felt a little wonky in a few parts um the there was a you had I the mario you had the mario brothers with the pipes and everything yeah the one you know where it's got the three layers the pow block and you know the crabs and turtles come out of the pipes you got to jump under them and then kick them it just felt so slippery and just I don't know what was up. I played this game plenty of times on like the GBA pack. And well, I think stuff. those are faster. I think it's putting in the original controls, which are super clunky. You should play that on the 7200 mm. on the Atari. That game is just pain in the ass on that system. That's on the Atari? Yeah, dude. Mario? I yeah. I have a copy of Mario Bros. on the Atari. I did not know that was a thing. Yeah. It's a legitimately thing. I've got it. Well, anyways, this game... It, like we said before, it's for the Wii U. It was developed by Nintendo EAD Tokyo, published by Nintendo, directed by Koichi Hayashida. It released back in April 2014. It's an action arcade collection. Uh, overall, pretty positive reviews. It's got like an 8-ish. I mean, it's nothing really new. It's not really like a full game, so it's not going to be like, wow, blow your mind, 10 out of 10, best experience ever. But, I mean, it's definitely, you know, serviceable for at least a few good hours of fun at a time. Like, I don't think I could sit there and play all of these challenges start to finish, but it would definitely be a great thing to pick up once or twice a week and kind of give you that taste of nostalgia. I feel like this is really a game for people who maybe didn't experience all these games. Like, I don't think you have to own and play Balloon Fight. I really don't. But having this with specific challenges in exposing you to balloon fight. I feel like this is probably one of the best ways to get maybe some younger people that are interested in retro gaming, but the prohibitive cost and kind of the, the lack of engagement with some of the older games. Like I'm definitely, I'm not a big arcade person. I like arcade games, but like I've never really played like, a ton of Pac-Man. I've never really played a ton of Donkey Kong. Like, those just don't interest me. This interests me far more than the actual games, and for it to all be in one place is awesome. And for a really good price. Complete in box, $14. That peaked back at $29.95 in February 2015. I think it's when it, was it like came out. Brand yeah. new almost. And then uh, loose copy, eleven forty five. That peaked at $26.50. In December of uh, 2014. Now, it's trending down on the loose a little bit. It, holding pretty good on the complete inbox. Like, I don't think that these games are going to really go anywhere. I think that enough of these were made and enough of them are out there. Especially because there was a one and two and this is the two of them put together. Yeah, I don't think they're going to go anywhere. And for, you know, 15 bucks... I think it's a steal. I think this is a great deal. It's 
for the remix pack. Yeah, and you know, you brought up a good point with this being for those that aren't really in these games or haven't had an interest in other titles. Or people who do, just to have something new. Yeah, exactly. So for us, like we played some of these games when we were growing up, the Mario 3, Mario 1 and 2. Uh, I had played Wario Woods, I think, once or twice in the past, but uh, not I've consistently. I've never played Wario Woods. The, the first challenge on the Wario Woods is to watch a tutorial of what Wario Woods is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it shows how popular that game was. And so, uh, you know, I look at this and, like, Excite Bike is not something that I played a whole ton of growing up, right? Oh, I did. But this, for me, though, it was like, you know, I didn't play a whole lot of Excite Bike. I may have played it once or twice and was like, I'm not a fan. This kind of got me into that mode of like, okay, cool. These controls aren't really that bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is your overall objective because it's kind of walking me through. Hey, look, we're going to have you do this. Like, those are things that I just never thought of when I was playing this game in the past. Now I have more interest to play this. And it acted to me as like an introductory, right? It was an introductory lesson into how to play certain games. And neither of us knew that you could wheelie over the obstacles. Yeah, I didn't know that I could over some of those obstacles wheelie over. It just wasn't a thought of mine. Uh, doing that and it's you would have to you know it's something that you would have to consistently play years ago and fully understand or you're playing it now and you're like all right let me find some tutorials this walks you through it and it does a great job of doing that and it has a few challenges for you to meet so right now i could pick up excite bike and probably enjoy it right now on the nes and not have any problems it's going to do that for younger generations going to do it for people like us that may not have played certain titles and now we want to because we have an introduction we have an understanding of the functions of that game how it controls the overall goals and methods and we could jump into that now and yeah. have fun so 14 dollars complete in box i picked this up at i think it was gamestop and it's totally worth it dude i, I mean if this game was 20 dollars right now it would be worth it you know it, it's just one of those titles that you can sit back like you said enjoy with a friend blow it out in a few different weekends you can sit back. It's not something you have to like, you know, jump into and invest a lot of time. You can say, hey, I'm going to play like. And they're three quick or four. too. Yeah. They're, these challenges aren't like, I mean, we could probably I could see this blow being this a good a party game almost. Like I would, I could almost see like a version of this as a party game where it's like instead of like the Mario Party like mini games where it's like challenges and you know trying to see who can get past a certain part in this just you know a little quick snippet like uh beat bowser you know and it's just you on the bridge with bowser you got to jump over and hit that hit that axe without getting torched but at the same time you're being timed right so it's yeah. like beat bowser in 15 seconds mm -hmm. now generally that's not too hard to do but that kind of gives you an idea on what these challenges are like and I enjoyed it a lot. So yeah, for me, dude, I say this is deflated at fourteen bucks. Deflated. I think, it's, I think it's worth more. Like twenty bucks would be like a fair price for this, and I would not be pissed off if I paid twenty for this. Like mm -hmm. it's good. It's not eight-ish on the reviews. That's not bad. That's actually pretty decent reviews yeah. for what's really just a bunch of mini games. Yeah, I'd really like to see more of these. I'd like to see a version of this on the Switch potentially. I'd like to see maybe some other industries like i'm not a fan of the sonic games really i would totally try like some sonic challenges you know mixed in with some other sega classic challenges yeah, like, like golden axe challenges thrown in there yeah, this could this genre could be like a whole you know retro revival thing i mean i don't think it's really going to happen since this game came out six years ago now and uh you know it's it if it didn't catch on then like that wildfire it's probably not going to now but who knows you know if you tell everybody about this podcast and everybody goes out and buys this game because of this podcast maybe it'll change the world maybe we'll see maybe you can help change the world so yeah deflated on this one definitely a great game we highly recommend it totally worth checking out uh for next week dude so my eye right now is on ivy the kiwi ivy the kiwi ivy the kiwi it's like a puzzle based game on the wii it's actually gone up uh quite a bit in recent years is my copy just a loose disc in a case probably feels like it oh i have a complete in box i didn't realize that so what i pick it up for like five ten bucks 449 if you were a pro member yeah so, i love the uh, artwork yeah so that is the exact 
price I picked it up for. I want to say it's going for a lot more nowadays, probably in the 30s, if I'm correct. No, don't peel off my sticker. Those are memories of how cheap I, I got that see game for. What the under sticker was, because it obviously got lowered down. Well, yeah, obviously got lowered down, but Brian, this is an original game. No, it's gonna peel off. Okay. Some original GameStop stickers show me how cheap it was. You realize <laughs> that how many of my games have like the original two ninety nine labels still on them? Hey, I mean, at least that way you know what you paid for. It it's really helpful for you know what we're doing now. This yeah. is a good foresight for you. Exactly. So four. 49 when they had pro membership they've obviously gotten rid of it but it's gone up in value and i think we play this next week if you're down for it yep all right so next week folks we'll be checking out ivy the kiwi we'll be checking out what's going on in the world of nobody knowing what the ps5 looks like and uh hopefully nothing else gets canceled uh good luck out there in the world folks finding uh toilet paper and flour flour yeah i tried to bake a cake last night there was no flour really? or vegetable oil really nope okay well i got olive oil but i don't think it's gonna be good on your cake no i would not so yeah. everybody you know I got eggs though stay safe out there hopefully you can uh get all the stuff that you need and get some games in your life and uh look at people very angrily when they cough that that's the other thing i've learned this week <laughs> just give people angry looks when they cough so all right well, uh, my name's John. I'm Ryan. And uh, we're not going to say it this time, but you're listening to episode 71 of the Game Deflators podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.